Hello, welcome to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB Reading Series. Fantastic Fiction is a monthly speculative fiction reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month, hosted by Ellen Datlow and me, Matthew Kressel. We spotlight well-known and up-and-coming science fiction, fantasy, and horror authors, and admission is always free. We publish a monthly podcast and video so people who can't attend the in-person event can still enjoy the readings. If you'd like to support the series, you can donate at kgbfantasticfiction.org slash support. Anyway, on to the show. Hello, hello. Oh, that's, that stopped really quick. How are you? How is everyone tonight? Come on, we could do better than that. All right, all right. This light isn't working. Is, the, uh, is it plugged in? Can we check? Oh, I see. It fell down there. Thank you. All right. So, happy Valentine's Day. I'm going to get the light going on here in a second. Uh, My name is Matt Kressel, and I co-host a series here with Ellen Datlow. This is Fantastic Fiction at KGB. We are on the second Wednesday of every month, and we are always free. We never charge a cover. All we ask is that you buy a drink, hard or soft, you support the bar, you support the series. The bartender Mary, wave Mary. All right, give Mary a hand. She's working hard to keep you hydrated, so please buy a drink and uh, stay hydrated. We, we appreciate that. Um, did everyone have enough chocolate today? I know I sure did. Um, I'm still getting my chocolate for Christmas. Yeah. Um, so. Next month, March 13th, we have Christopher Rowe and Moses Osei Utomi. We can clap hard on that. Come on. All right. April 10th, Jennifer Marie Brissett and Robert Levy. May 8th, Anya Johanna De Niro and John Wiswell. June 12th, Grady Hendrix and Bracken McLeod. July 10th, A.T. Sayer. Where's... There is right there, there he is. Uh, August 14th, James Chambers, and September 11th, Sarah Beth Durst, and accompanied with our favorite guest, TBA. TBA, thank you. You guys are good, you guys are good, A plus. Uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to welcome our readers tonight. We have uh, Isabel Yap and Randy Dawn going to read for us. I'm told there are Books, plural, for sale. Uh, Randy Dawn is selling. What do you have over there, Randy? Let's, uh, let's see. Have, have my novel, Tune In Tomorrow, which I'll be reading from. Tune In Tomorrow. Uh, the Four Question Marks of the Apocalypse. The Four right? Question Marks of the Apocalypse. And I have a short story that I'll also be reading. Which I'm, I'm in as well. And which Gordon, Gordon Lindner is also in as well. And Isabel, you're also selling a, a copy? Of I have one copy of my book. One <laughs> copy of Isabel's book. The highest bidder. Which <laughs> may either be purchased or possibly given away. Yeah, we'll, which, yeah. uh, Isabel will decide. I'll decide. Um, thank you. So our first, our, first readers, our first reader tonight is Randy Dawn. Randy Dawn is the author of the best-selling novel, Tune In Tomorrow, which was a finalist in the 2023 Next Generation Indie Awards. Her latest story, The Fifth Horseman, appears in the new anthology, The Four Question Marks of the Apocalypse, for sale over there. Her stories have also appeared in Soul Scream, Horror for the Throne, and Even in the Grave, and she is the co-editor of Across the Universe, Tales of Alternative Beatles an entertainment journalist who writes for the Los Angeles Times, Variety, and other publications. Randy lives in Brooklyn with her spouse and a fluffy, sleepy Westie. I should also mention that you host a great reading series in Brooklyn. The name of the series is Brooklyn Books and Booze, Books and, Booze and it's at the Barrow's Intense Ginger Taste uh, Ginger Tasting Room in Industry City. Industry City. It is a great reading series. Seriously, it's, it's amazing. Here's Randy Dawn. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, 
everyone. This is so exciting to actually be behind the podium. I've been in here a lot of times and watched folks behind the podium, so it is so lovely to uh, be here to share some of my stuff with you. Uh, I'm going to make myself timed so that I don't run out of time. So I'm going to read from two different things tonight. I'm going to read a little bit from the short story um, called The Fifth Horseman, which is in this four question marks of the apocalypse. Um, I did the every story as the four blanks, and it could be a million different things. I did the four rock stars of the apocalypse. And uh, then I will be reading a little bit from Tune In Tomorrow, my novel, which is also av available for sale. Um, if you come over to the table, there are little sachets of loose tea which tie in with the book as well, and I'll explain that in a minute. But those are for free, so you can come over and grab one. Uh, let's see here. So I'll start with The Fifth Horseman. The ancient metal beast roared down the sandy stretch of highway, spewing forth the sound of mighty decay. Carrrr! At its approach, quivery desert hares scampered into their holes, leaving behind a trail of tiny dark pellets. Rattlesnakes hesitated mid-rattle, tongues flicking, tasting the oncoming darkness. Vultures lost their appetites and sought high ground, at high ground atop Sagoro cacti. All deferred to a creature more mighty, more ancient, more odiferous than themselves. Gathering velocity, the beast crested a hump on the narrow two-lane highway with a bladding harrrrg. The formerly maroon two-ton passenger van released itself from earthly gravity, soaring skyward as if it might pierce heaven itself, then tumbled back down on the tarmac, stomping like a mighty foot. The landing kicked up southwest territory dirt and pebbles and caused a pregnant desert mouse to spontaneously birth a three-headed monster child. Many moons ago, the beast's encrusted maroon body had proclaimed its true name as Dodge. And the world had turned over and bent inside out and moved on, and these days the hand-painted curlicue font on its haunch declared its name to be Ezekiel, Zeke to its four occupants. And Zeke's mission was clear, guide the band to show low in time for tonight's gig. Directions had been relayed through the sole remaining operational GPS in the world, which hung suction cup to the van's streaked inside windshield. What issued the directions? From where did they originate? Zeke couldn't know. In the end, it was just a gas-guzzling made in Detroit monstrosity with over 200,000 miles on its odometer and no actual sentience. That didn't mean it couldn't understand instructions. But when Zeke hit the ground at speed, it understood the mission had changed. As much as a 1993 ex-Dodge touring van could know anything, Zeke knew this. They were never going to make it to Sholo. Woo-wee! cried Rowan, fingers of one hand curled around the van's steering wheel, his other hand, out, his other hand clutching the outer frame of the driver's side window. His biblically long strawberry hair trailed like sparking fire in the wind. Believe we done hit 88 that time. Opposite him in, show, in shotgun, Blanca rubbed her forehead, a knot rising already between, beneath her platinum bangs. She'd wonked her head on the roof when they'd landed and practically seen stars. There's Cassiopeia. Daddy, there's Pegasus. Now she sat as still as possible to avoid provoking any more displays of vehicular savagery, though Rowan was going to Rowan while behind Zeke's wheel. The, fan, the van had ferried them through all eight territories while accepting regular abuse from its driver, and sometimes Blanca questioned whether it was really Rowan even driving the thing. Zeke had a mind of its own. Much further, Row, Blanca clenched her jaw. The roadie clocked the GPS which hung askew from the windshield, solar cord disengaged. The screen showed an empty blotch of brown bisected by a snaking black line of highway. 84 miles to show low. What, you got a whiz? It's only DEFCON 4. I can wait. Remind me again. DEFCON 5 means I'm empty. DEFCON 1 means you gone and pissed yourself. Roe grinned his, his coffee-stained smile, and Blanca's heart did a little flip. Yo comprende, senorita. He spoke the mangled Spanish with an intentional lack of accent. Blanca unhooked her seatbelt and turned around to assess the damage. Anybody bleeding back there? Deep inside the vehicle, Zeke was a four-seater with a roomy storage area, Charna narrowed her green eyes from beneath a chaotic thicket of jet black hair. Her arms and legs stuck out in all directions, restraining the guitars and drum kit. A bra rested on her head like a double yarmulke, straps dangling over her ears. 
Someone's duffel bag had vomited clothing across the interior. Meanwhile, then, nearly luminescent with fright, clung on like a pale rhesus monkey to the back of Rose's seat, his teeth clamped on the vinyl covering. Are you never gonna learn to pack? Charna growled at Blanca, whisking the bra off her head and reorganizing the instrument cases. Her beloved bass first, then Blanca's acoustic guitar and Ben's disassembled drum kit boxes. How many years we've been doing this, Blanky? Don't call me that, Blanca snapped, abruptly befuddled by the questions. And I do know how to pack. It wasn't her fault that Rowan treated the empty road like it was the Talladega Super Speedway. Don't yell at her, Ven murmured. His teeth had left marks on the vinyl. She's not the speed demon. Blanca gave his hand a quick squeeze and he relaxed. Ven presented his terrifying six foot three shaven skull clad in black. Behind the kit, he was hell unleashed, sweat coursing down his body, face a rictus of rage. But off stage, he was a giant softy, shy as all get out. Well, remind our roadie that if he breaks our only transpo out of this hellscape, Charna gestured at the desert racing past, and we get stranded and have to eat each other to survive, he goes first. <laughs> Message received loud and damn clear, Rose shouted, gunning the motor as a little fuck you, then settled into a reasonably insane speed of 15 miles per hour over the limit. Blanca turned back around, positioning herself against the side door so she could surreptitiously watch Rowan. He'd never done so much as, look, as wink in her direction, but she'd been in love with him so long, as her, so long that her heart had reshaped itself, like liquid hardened in the key mold. Sure, he could act like a dumbass nutcase, but there was a dark undercurrent of sorrow in him that caught at her, hidden doors she'd never been able to unlock. They all came with secret histories about how their worlds had fallen apart, but Rowan held his particularly close to the vest. He'd never opened up, not in all this time, least, not, not that she could recall. Chewing on a thumbnail, Blanca frowned. Why wasn't she sure? And why couldn't she answer Charna's question? Shouldn't she know how long they'd been on the road? Ro, how many years have, have we been doing this? She asked. A rueful smile crept onto his face. That time again? Blanca tilted her head. You ask me that every couple of weeks, Ro B. No, I don't. You do. You all do. I'm the only one with any long-term memory in this here vehicle. Blanca stilled again. He was right in part. She clearly recalled her life as a part-time dental assistant in Brooklyn who baked cupcakes on weekends, who watched her neighborhood crumble into chaos after the power grid died. But what she'd done since transforming into a singer-guitarist in a band traveling across this crazy quilt of a country once known as the U.S. of A. in a shit heap of a van with a mind of its own, well, that was less clear. All she could conjure were flashes and snippets of in-between time, like she was living in her own movie montage. Rowan rubbed his bristly face. What if I told you we'd been a road for 13 years, eight months, and six days? Charna thrust her face between the front seats, and I'd call you a damn liar. I turned 31 last month, and you dorks are younger than me, and she paused. You didn't even tell me happy birthday. We did, Rose sighed. Had the world's crappiest cake slice and tequila shots and in a half-collapsed diner back in Colorado Springs. You passed out. Charna sat back hard in her seat and crossed her arms. Huh. For real? Blanca glanced between them. I mean, that can't be. Ro tucked some hair behind his ear and stared at her so long she had to flap her hands to get his eyes back on the road. Then he did something brand new. He cupped his hand against her jaw and gently tugged on her earlobe before turning back to the dimming blue skies. I'll stop there. Thank you. So the rest of that story is in the four question marks of the apocalypse. I have one copy here. The rest of them you can get it on Amazon and other places. Um, so I'm going to turn to uh, a chapter in my book, Tune In Tomorrow, really quickly. Uh, Tune In Tomorrow is about a reality TV show run by mythical creatures for mythical creatures, but starring humans. It's, it's a very different tone than I was just reading. It's punny and silly and... Uh, very backstagey because I, as I, as was meant, as Matt mentioned in my in my bio, I do write about entertainment journalism. So um, this is kind of deep into the book. I'm more or less going to dive in, but I wanted to let you know our main character is Star, who is an actress, a human actress. She's been hired on the show, the first hire in 30 years, and she is investigating a mystery of what happened to the woman who had her had her job before she had it, because that woman just kind of disappeared, and no one will talk about it. 
So she's going to investigate, and she has to go into the security guard's cave and find scripts. And that's going to be a clue to what she needs to know. The security guard is named Phil, and he's a dragon. Yeah, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> we have Phil fans in the room. On the surface, Phil made sense as a security guard. He was a proper, enormous dragon, theoretically full of fire in the belly and leftover meat in the teeth. But so far as Star had seen, Phil was a receptionist. For one thing, his belly fire was mostly a small, flickering flame. My therapist says I got lack of confidence. He'd, he'd muttered to Star some weeks ago in his back, back in his tractor-trailer-sized voice, I got issues. One of which was that flame, which meant he'd be more likely to smoke things than scorch them, and the fact that he'd never consumed a human. Yet, he always made sure to add, third eye nictitating over one lightning bolt pupil. It was meant to be a threatening gesture, but mostly it made him seem like he was winking at Star. His issues left him with a smaller skill set and fewer job prospects than most dragons of his size, which meant he put extra effort into uh, guarding the contents of his cave, a jagged, rocky opening that burst from the wall behind the reception desk like an explosion and emitted damp breezes. Star hadn't expected pushback when she asked if she could go through the archived scripts he held back there. Much had happened in the central, central, central Park Centaur Park Nexus, but the action item that had stuck with her was Nico's advice to read Joseph's old scripts. She knew they were kept in the cave. For weeks, Phil had refused her entry. It's a mess back there, he said. I don't get visitors. He hadn't budged when she promised to leave any gold or jewelry alone either. The mere mention of precious valuables had made the spikes on his back rise up, piercing his gray shirt, sparks that had shot from a corner of his mouth. Star went back to the drawing board, refusing to give up. The scripts were the one tidbit of useful intel she'd gleaned from that bonkers afternoon in the Nexus, and she held on to that thread with both hands as the weeks dragged by. There was no section in the guide about how to deal with dragons, and back home on her side of the veil, the internet was so chock full of dragon lore as to be virtually useless. She wasn't going to stab him with a lance, and Oleander, Oleander is the um, a brownie assistant that everybody gets. Oleander had no tea that would knock out a, a creature of that size. Besides, someone would notice an unconscious security dragon if they did that. One idea with potential came from a web-based cooking show about historical recipes in which she learned that some dragons could be filled with huge servings of Yorkshire parkin. She made eight trays of the sticky gingerbread cake and hauled them in, and they disappeared down Phil's expansive gullet in less than a minute. He belched and left a smoky stain on the far wall, then went back to being intractable. Star was getting desperate. Cessation of hostilities with Fiona had been fresh when she'd first approached Phil, and they couldn't last forever. She was going to have to find a misdirection that had staying power. Maybe offering Phil something he found irresistible. All of this assumed Nico hadn't been having her on, providing Star with her own misdirection. Ugh, Nico. He wouldn't come within a few feet of her except on set, and his sole communication since Central Park had been to send loud, gaudy flowers daily to her dressing room. The card always read the same, forgive me. Nope, thought Star each time, handing them over to Oleander to share with the other brownies, who ate them with relish, <laughs> then picked their teeth with the stems. Watching Nico wear his hair shirt was satisfying, and Star was doing just fine in the silence. She had a new project in Phil. Mortals, steal from me. Phil slurped sriracha from his mug. If my possessions are under threat, I can't help myself. It's in the blood. Even if I let you in, I'd feel you in there rooting around. And you'd end up mangled or maimed or smoked, and I'd end up fired, and my therapist would have to see me four times a week instead of three. Star shivered. It was like talking to Hannibal Lecter about his favorite recipes. <laughs> Phil ran his long tongue around the inside of his cup, lapping up the final drops of the hot sauce. Sigh, there is never enough. A small explosion lit Star up. That was it. Sriracha was going to save the day. Over the past months, Star had observed a few interesting facts about the effect of Sriracha on Phil the Dragon. For one thing, he could sip it by the gallon. For another, it sent him into a blissful, meditative state that reminded her of her brother Bill getting stoned on the couch in their basement back in Maryland. She'd brought in bottles of the stuff from time to time as a gift, but now she was going to give him more than he could handle. 
The next day, she cleaned out the Costco warehouse of their supply of the condiment and began importing five-gallon jugs of Senor Sriracha through the portal, stacking them in her dressing room. Three days later, the room had filled with 14 containers, and Oleander had questions. Glad you asked, said Star, because I'm going to need your help. Oleander clapped her hands in delight until Star revealed how close she was going to have to come to the dragon. All you have to do is make sure he keeps drinking, said Star. She had brought in a series of PVC pipes linked together in a looping, swirling shape to serve as a crazy straw that would slow the draw on Phil's slurping ability. Based on observing the dragon, Star guessed he'd go through five gallons every two minutes, which would give her nearly a half an hour to get in, search, and get out. Oleander is not on board with this at all, said the brownie. Must Ms. Star do this? Star must, she said, giving the brownie a hug. But if you don't want to help, I'll ask. No, Oleander stood firm. Of course, Oleander is here to help, but Star must be quick and careful, yes? Hell yes, Star nodded. I'll be faster than I've ever been before. With that, they wheeled out the containers in a cart and unveiled them in front of the dragon. For you, said Star, waving her hand over the containers like a presenter on a game show. Phil smoked appreciatively and dropped his, dropped his magazine. For me? For putting up with my endless questions, said Star. I even got you a special straw. Delighted, Phil snatched up the PVC pipe construction in his recently painted talons, stared into it, and began to bounce with excitement. The entire lobby shook. Oleander peered from behind Star. Oleander is here to help with the containers, said the brownie, voice weak but steady. No eating brownies, yes? Phil's eyes were wide. He could barely focus on anything other than the bounty of containers in the shopping carts. No brownie eating. Got it, he muttered. Sriracha me. Star had plotted this out as best she could. Secrecy was optimal. She didn't want to provoke questions or have someone in charge tell her she couldn't do this. Chris was directing that afternoon, which meant they were bound to start late. Jason was at a network meeting all morning. She'd convinced the Harrys and makeup fay to do her, hair, do her up early, getting her hair pinned back and held in place, and slid into costume before bringing Phil the goodies. She padded the pockets of her bomber jacket and nodded. Don't go, Oleander grabbed onto her jacket. Too much danger. Not if you help. Star hugged the brownie and took a deep breath, imagining Sam, which is her character on the show, Fearless, game for anything. She sw shot a quick glance at Phil, who was settling against the outer wall of the cave, eyes fluttering closed as he slid into Sriracha Bliss. Her heart was pounding, time to do this thing. She flattened herself against the cave entrance and tiptoed in like a ninja. Her phone's flashlight app illuminated the dim cave interior, a cool breeze caressing her cheeks. A thigh-high brown shag rug swallowed up her legs, and she felt like she was wading through very tall grasses. Though she tried to move quickly, the shag dragged on her. As she passed through Phil's living quarters, she noticed a stereo system with speakers the size of refrigerators, a lava lamp with what, with what looked like real molten rock inside, and giant posters pasted on the rough walls for films like Firestarter, The Towering Inferno, and Lair of the White Worm. <laughs> Abruptly, the sea of shag ended, and the room broke open into a space even more vast and imposing than the lobby she'd left behind. A deep pile of gold coins obscured the floor, illuminating the room with a warm glow. Fairy gold, she thought. Guess they have to store it somewhere. Star leaned down to pick up a coin, but jerked back. No point in prematurely waking the beast from his bliss. On entering the cave, she ran out of plan. She had no idea what it would look like inside, and so had no idea how to start looking for scripts. But that turned out to be the easy part. Amid the piles of gold and shining gems stood a, stood, a, stood a series of battered and rusting file cabinets. Some were as tall as Star, others loomed over two stories high. Drawers hung open here and there, coughing up loose pages and stapled together script-sized sheaves. It was as daunting as a look from Fiona, and Star sighed, grasping the task at hand. There wasn't enough sriracha in New York City to give her the time she'd need to properly investigate in here. Phil would die in an overdose before she could even make a dent. A light film of sweat broke out on her forehead. Well, it wasn't for, if it wasn't for dumb luck, I'd have no luck at all, she thought, and began clambering over the coins. Reaching her first file cabinet, she dug through an open drawer randomly. She tossed aside scripts written on parchment paper as too ancient. Ditto to those mimeographed in purple ink. 
Every so often, she pushed her injury a bit too far and had to pause, sipping long, shallow breaths. Oleander's pain-relieving tea was a godsend, but not a cure-all. All along, her heart pounded, and every small sound made her jump. Five! The brownie called down the throat of the cave, alerting her to the dragon's progress. It was the one alert they thought they could get away with while Phil disappeared in his hot sauce fugue. But if he was running on five of 14, Star knew time was running short. I'll stop there. Thank you all so very much. for about 10 minutes, uh, have a drink and enjoy the time in between and talk to each other. <laughs> hey there, everybody, <coughs> welcome back. Whoops. You. We're about to start the second half. Thank you. There are a few chairs over there, if anyone wants to see. There's a couple of chairs and there's more seating back there if you want it. <coughs> and it's not great to to stand right in the, the only exit. Please don't stand right here, which is the only exit out of this place. So make a space. <laughs> Thank you. Great. <laughs> All right. Our next reader is Isabel Yap. Yes. Who is, hey. who is the author of Never Have I Ever Stories, which was published by Small Beer Press in 2021 and was named one of the 2021 best books for adults by the New York Public Library. Yeah. <laughs> Her work has appeared in venues including Tour.com, which is now React Tour, <coughs> but was Tour.com when she was published, <laughs> Lit Hub, and Year's Best Weird Fiction. I'm sorry, the light's in the way here. <coughs> Her work has appeared in venues in, oh, I'm sorry, I'm repeating that. Her collection won the British Fantasy Award and was a finalist for the Ignite, the Locust, the Crawford, and World Fantasy Award. Woo. By day, she works in the tech industry as a product manager. She likes visiting museums, playing the ukulele. Did you bring a ukulele? I did not. Oh. <laughs> Next time. And commiserating with others about how hard it is to write books. Please welcome Isabel. Yeah. OK. Uh, can everyone hear me OK? Great. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming out. I know it's cold, uh, and it is many things today. It's Valentine's Day, it's Ash Wednesday for Catholics out there. <laughs> um, and yeah, I really appreciate everyone coming out here to read. Um, this is my book. Like I said, I have one copy. I will give it away for free to anyone who like boldly wants to come up and say I want it we'll after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So happy for whoever wants it, come up. Um, I'm just showing it to everyone. Small Beer Press um, is a fantastic publisher. They uh, actually are not publishing new books anymore. Um, well, for now. For now, for now. Deeply sad about it. Um, so, so, so grateful to be a small beer author. So if you, doesn't need to be my book, like look at their catalog, buy some of their books. Kelly Link's books, uh, Sophia Samatar's novels are um, small beer books. So many great collections, Sarah Pinsker's collection. Kelly Link has a new book coming out soon. Maybe it's out yesterday. I don't know when it came out. So like. Support small beer. Um, okay, I'll stop doing my spiel. Uh, I'm reading from an unpublished story. It's also unfinished. Um, and I think the one thing I want to say about this story is that uh, it, it's slightly relevant to know that I've been a K-pop fan since 2008. So <laughs> that is a lot of the inspiration behind this story. Um, I'm not going to read the title because I don't like my working title. So I'll just start. <laughs> um, okay. Do you remember what you said to me as we descended on the singing planet? It was just after lunchtime. The lights of the stadium slid over your face, bright pink and blue like the sky we'd left behind. It was the first thing we'd seen in days that wasn't space. We gathered by the windows to take it in, but standing anywhere in that room, you would have seen it. Our faces holographing across the sky, the incessant rainbow bloom of colors that were the LED fireworks they'd anchored across the screens to greet visitors. Ariel even emerged from where she'd been vomiting in the bathroom. 
She never got used to the tofu-like paste we ate, though when I asked her if she wanted one of my stashed away energy bars, she laughed and said she didn't want to crap it out weird, and anyway, it was all good. She'd lost three pounds. Now the crop top for Here We Go wouldn't look so weird on her. The singing planet you could see beneath the stadium, bright red rock with violent splashes of green and blue in the middle. There was a crevice in it filled with what looked like teeth, and I realized it was seats. It looked like a gaping maw. In the air-conditioned shuttle, I imagined the raw blasting heat of it like a tamed sun, something we were flying too close to. From all the documentaries we'd watched, I thought it would be familiar, navigable, but when I saw it, I felt odd, like it was wrong to see it with my own eyes. I could feel my heart pound more slowly in my chest, and I felt and followed the urge to twitch my fingertips to prove I was still actual. On the surface of the planet, the part we'd taken over and built our little human environment on looked like an eye or a moss-covered wound. I'd wanted to do this for so long, and now that I was here, I, I didn't. I wanted to evaporate instead. The fear that followed came fast and horrible. Then you moved close to me, close enough that it wouldn't be strange if our hands touched. You said, whoa, we're really here. You saved me from an unfortunate Ariel-esque incident. Even now when I feel empty, it's often something you said or did that makes me remember there are things to hold me together, keep me here. My paperweight, my erstwhile gravity. If I could focus on you, I could feel myself again and understand where I was, living our dream. Lady Rev had a song about this, but they'd never managed to make it out here. I was lucky, so fucking lucky, too lucky, and I knew I wasn't going to die, even if I felt like I was. I nodded. I needed to look all right because the camera was on you. The camera was always on you. I didn't blame the AI making those decisions. You were always the prettiest, but I wanted my screen time too, so I smiled and said in English, it's amazing. Not to be outdone, Sayuri clapped both hands to her mouth and let out a thin wail of admiration. I knew the cut they would make of this reaction, something they'd play twice, maybe lingering on her shiny eyes. Sayu had mastered reactions so well, they'd become their own form of authentic manipulation. We'd all learned how, to some degree, but she was excellent at picking her moments. If we die after performing here, I don't think I'd have regrets, you whispered. It took me a moment to realize you were speaking on the private line, the one we'd painstakingly hacked so we could talk without the mics picking up every damn word. In my relief, I lost the sense of foreboding and found myself, typical in those days, mostly fighting the urge to kiss you. I always wondered if it would have worked, me reaching for your hand in that moment. They would have played it as us being lovey-dovey again. They'd encircle our hands with hearts and mark blush lines over our cheeks and make sure it was clear that I was looking at you while you were looking out at the world. But I didn't because that moment mattered too much. For all our brazen acting, because it made us more popular and the group with it, there were still some things I didn't want the cameras to touch. They could have your smile and all of our pretending, but what you actually meant to me, that was still sacred, secret. Three times you made my heart flutter. One, seven weeks after I first arrived at the trainee center, Seoul made me heartsick. I miss the broad highways and aggressive sunshine of California. I miss my mother's kimchi jjigae and the way she frowned, smiled after looking at me, an exasperation filled with tenderness. Growing up, imagined or not, I felt I'd been her perennial failure. An ocean away, chasing my dream, I missed my mother by judging myself in her stead. I'd wanted so badly to become a singer. I'd spent my whole life aching to perform, but when I actually got the call back from the agency, when someone said, I can see it, I want you, all my bravado melted into fear, a million dark voices saying, who do you think you are? Arriving here, meeting everyone else striving for the same dream, I understood what a fool I'd been. I wasn't enough in any dimension. I thought I could sing, but so could everyone else, 
and they could bend their voices or belt or reach notes I could only manage if my eye did some unpleasant squinching, something the vocal trainer called out my second week. I thought I was a decent dancer, but actually, my torso was stiff, and when I was concentrating, like I always was picking up new choreography, my face went blank. I never thought I was pretty, but I thought my face had charm. Now my face in the mirror seemed incomprehensibly bloated, no matter what I ate, which was as little as I could manage. Instead of filling me up with possibility, this city scooped out more and more of me. I filled the void of wanting to be famous with additional nothingness. I was lost. Grandma used to joke I was her sparkling child making microphones out of everything my tiny fist could grab, and becoming a trainee killed that spark. I'd burnt out from never being enough. That evening, drained from practice and hating life more than I thought possible, I locked the bathroom door and picked up a razor. I knew the threat was empty even as I touched my finger to the pink strip above the silver edge. I was a coward. I didn't want to die. It seemed for a minute like hurting myself might soothe the deranged monster that wanting to be famous had created inside me, an offering for failing it. That was a comfort. If my voice or my pitiful footwork weren't enough, then some skin might, the vivid sting of a cut might. I pressed the edge to my skin but made no motion, feeling the thin strip of metal, relishing it. You think you're all alone, whoa, 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 but that is where you're wrong, oh, oh, oh. Someone started blasting Lady Rev's I'll be there outside the door. It was too timely, Ginny's beautiful timbre on that bridge reminding me why I'd come, to be like them, to touch others like they'd touch me, to give hope and joy and to make people smile. Lofty goals that had lost their meaning somewhere between the cup of yogurt I'd had for dinner two weeks straight and my inability to tilt my hips at the right angle in the chorus. How trying had started to seem futile, not worth it, against everything I used to believe. Two knocks at the door, gentle over the swelling violins. Alice, you in there? Even then, I knew your voice. You'd spent three years of elementary school in LA, which made you my default translator and a life raft to this new world. There were other girls who were fluent in English, other girls who were kind, other girls who wanted to help explain something or walk through the steps, but slower. And I didn't know how to receive their kindness. I didn't know how to receive yours. But you kept holding it out, even when the others got awkward and walked slowly away. I said, uh-huh. Tears rolled down my cheeks, dripped onto my old Golden State Warriors shirt. Can I get my eye cream? I forgot to apply it. I inhaled. I put the razor down. Sure, I said, hastily patting my tears away. Rubbing was bad. Rubbing gave you wrinkles. I opened the door, stepping back and lining myself with it so you could reach the cupboard over the sink. You glanced at me, at my obvious red eyes, then looked away. You plucked a tissue from the box on the counter and handed it to me. You said nothing but stayed there, tapping the eye cream over your eyelid, under your waterline, until I collected myself. Then you caught my eye in the mirror and offered a smile. Sorry and encouraging, like you knew what I'd nearly come to, and it didn't matter. In retrospect, it should have been obvious that you'd never have forgotten such a core step in your skincare routine. Two. When we were memorizing the choreography for Bring It, there was that bit in verse two where we had to body roll aggressively. My body was like an uncooked noodle, unable to bend that way. Aram walked me through it painstakingly for the better part of an hour, and we got to a passable S wave in the end, though she did say, Alice, if you can't get something this basic, I'm not sure you'll survive the next assessment. I thanked her, sheepish. I'd been thinking that the whole time. You were sitting on the far side of the practice room, headphones hooked in, humming some lyrics. After Aram left, I sat to start stretching. You startled me when I was folded over, touching my shoulder. The stretch is important, you said, so that your torso isn't so stiff. I've heard that a lot, I said, trying not to be stung. Can I help? You smiled. That might have been the first time I actually noticed your dimples. Sure, I said. Helping apparently meant pushing me into the stretch more than my body thought was a justifiable amount. It hurt, but there was something clarifying too, and it probably wasn't only the stretch, though if I named what I was feeling, that would make it far too real. Three, while filming the music video for The Red Planet of Love, 
The director had made a bunch of storylines. For the bridge, they'd stylized the two of us meeting. I was the Earth Princess, you were the Alien Princess. They'd given you unimaginative elf ears, beautifully intricate blonde pink ombre braids, and galaxy contact lenses, purple outer ring, gray inner ring, and a glossy sheen that made your irises enormous. Director Nim made you turn your head slowly over your exposed shoulder, your hair spilling over it, the flower crown above it absolutely loaded with roses and lavender, which they were going to cover in CGI sparkles for the final cut. You wore an expression of gentle, lovely bewilderment as you laid eyes on me. How is it that we're meeting here beyond where my hopes could reach? The music video catches you blinking in slow motion, your eyelashes long and tinged with glitter. I had my own excessive makeup on. I think they had me play the Earth Princess because by then I developed a knack for being greasy, flirting with everyone on our team and any variety show host in an over-the-top way that came through well on screen and made for good 10-second clips. I'd latched onto this talent early on when I realized it was a differentiator. I knew how to work the camera too. But when you caught my gaze in that moment, my mind went blank. Why am I the one who must move close to you? Why am I the one who can't look at you? The lyrics were suddenly too much. I was supposed to draw close, run the back of my hand down your cheek, at which point a bunch of CGI flowers would burst into bloom, then lean in and whisper something to you. The camera would only capture the lower half of our faces, deliciously close, and show our hands entwining as I knelt down beside you. But I couldn't move. Tell me what we're doing here on this red planet of love. Cut, the director said. Angie, Alice, what's wrong? I blinked. You burst out laughing, which eased my own panic enough for me to laugh and apologize. Here's something funny. I did the next six takes fine, as scripted, but they actually ended up using that first candid version for a few seconds in the final MV. 345 million views and counting the number of times people have watched me fall in love with you. We were staying at the most luxurious hotel, the one where every hallway had a different theme. They hadn't made us roommates by default this time. Ariel was feeling ill and fell asleep shortly after showering, exhausted from practice. We'd spent the last slow hour of descent running through our opening number on empty stomachs. I lay on my bed, the one closer to the door, and scrolled through my phone. I saw that Aram and Sejong had started a live stream and were daring each other to show their bare faces. Aram smeared a dollop of oil-based cleanser on Sejong's face. Sejong shrieked, saying she wasn't ready yet. Hearts and stars poured down the screen in a torrent. Serum, as their pairing was called, was pretty popular. But as the princess couple, we had 10 times the number of mentions at any given moment. Your text popped over the live stream. Come outside. You didn't want to knock in case that would wake up Ariel, who was always the lightest sleeper. I slid out of bed, pulled on a baseball cap, checked my face in the mirror. Yikes. The makeup artists tomorrow had their work cut out for them. You were standing outside in a beanie, an oversized cardigan, and joggers. Hey, you said. Hi. We stood in the hallway, silent. You got lucky with the solo room? That's right. You had incredible luck. I'd seen the video edits, is Sola a witch? Sola winning games for seven minutes straight. So it wasn't surprising. What was surprising was how my heart was reacting to this moment, like there was something strange in this artificial atmosphere. Sunlight poured in through the big windows down the hall, haloing your hair, which had been bleached and dyed a light pink, a variation on your Red Planet MV look. The sunlight itself was a moody red, tinting our skin so that it looked like we were blushing. We were awkward again, like we were on camera for the first time and figuring out our personalities, like we were back in that intro vocal session sweating over the sheet music. It was too much, so you said, want to explore? You didn't seem to be holding a camera. Are you filming? No, the point is not to film it. They're going to get so much content out of us tomorrow. When else are we going to be in outer space? You glanced around, and I felt a sudden twinge of dread that our lives were now so full of this, checking for who might be listening, talking like we had a script to follow. But you always cared less about it because the rest of this life came so easily to you. I hope that anyway, as you leaned in to whisper, I miss you. 
It hurt to hear that, to know what I'd done, how things weren't the same, weren't fixed, and I knew I'd been ignoring you, but what was I supposed to do? Talk about it? I didn't want to, but part of me knew. On this planet, I probably had to stop running. After all, we had nowhere else to go. When we first made contact with the singing planet, I was lying on the sofa in the living room, legs hooked over the couch, scrolling through Instagram. Dad was playing the news too loud like he always did. The first rover had landed safely and sent back some photos. It looked like desert, mostly gray rock, what you'd imagine a space atmosphere to be like if you didn't have much imagination. That was before they'd found the stadium with its carved out seats and the stage half buried in rubble. The implements that people thought were weapons or magic staffs before realizing they were some kind of microphone. The debate about whether it was aliens or another human civilization that had once performed on this floating piece of rock went on for years, flaring up and dying down. There are still project teams at MIT and Georgia Tech trying to make contact with whatever once occupied the planet. That bright home, human hope that something, something else is out there, that we're not alone. They say it's got a similar atmosphere, Dad said. Next, they're going to start sending people. That's so scary, Mom said while rubbing Pepero's belly. It can't end well. Darren Myers had the same idea as Dad. Two years later, he declared that he was going to rebuild the stadium, rendering a structure faithful to the original. Original, in this case, meant the best guess of scholars who'd imagined what it could have been like, which was iffy in its own way, like we were claiming to be historians of a history that could never be ours. We could do concerts in space, like the planet obviously meant for us to, by wandering into our solar system. He'd make it affordable for a certain percent of the audience, and there'd be enough testing for everyone to ensure the stadium and hotels were safe. It dovetailed nicely with the successful round trip of his first space bus, which had been an exciting triumph. Even his naysayers had to grudgingly admit so. He was obviously in it for the money, but he kept peddling this vision of beauty and passion, which the world sorely needed then. Reactions were mixed, and there was a clamor about redirecting the fortune it would cost into more useful things on this earth. But when had billionaires ever listened to anyone? That afternoon, though, flat on my back and not knowing how much I'd miss this ordinary weekend feeling one day, I didn't think much of either statement. I was just a kid trying to survive life and school and the scary idea that I might like girls. I taped up posters of Lady Rev on my walls and was trying to become someone who was good at math. I wanted to be a singer already then, but it was still months before my fateful audition. I played twice for the talent shows at school and received a pretty good reception to my guitar covers. I had a few videos up online, but nothing had gone viral. Shortly after joining the agency, I would take them all down. They wouldn't, that wouldn't stop them resurfacing when the backlash happened and people commented on my flat notes, braces, and obviously pre-plastic surgery chin. In the shower, I'd sing my heart out, wiggling a finger to trace out my runs, but the dream wasn't painful yet then because it didn't seem possible. It was safe enough to think that way when it didn't seem likely to come true that one day the world could be my stage or more than the world, the universe. And that's where I'll stop. everybody for coming and hopefully we'll see you next month second Wednesday of every month thanks you have been listening to the fantastic fiction at KGB reading series check out our website at kgbfantasticfiction.org and click on support if you'd like to help keep the series going anyway that's our show thanks for listening and see you next month